thank you. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be in Florence and to be uh, here in Giesele. Um I want to just start, I'm afraid, by um, cha changing the title of my talk. Uh, I was once at a conference where a colleague said he had to change both the title of his talk, his name, and his affiliation. They had gotten his name wrong. His affiliation had changed in between the time when he had first been solicited and the time that he came. And of course, talk titles change often. And this one, I realized, ultimately, although we're really in a period of the mobility turn and the ter talk of, about mobility is very, uh, very much uh, a part of discussion in migration studies, as in geography, history, etc. Uh, but it really, it's the talk should be called A New Look at the Economics of Migration, because I really will be speaking about migration in particular, not all mobility in general. So you all know, perhaps, Max Frisch's famous line, we asked for workers, we got people instead. Migration is an economic reality, uh, but it becomes a cultural one. It was not Frisch's purpose, but the language around migration has been hijacked, I would say, by a xenophobia that emphasizes the cultural, um, the alien at best, the terrorist at worst, uh, combined with fears of an economic nemesis of the immigrant as job taker or as wage depressor. So that the other is also constructed uh, as an um, however, as an economic other, but it is the cultural other which really has become the focus of so many attacks. Um, one, just one question here. I just want to get better light, so if I can move this a bit like that. And for moving the PowerPoint, then I use this is the object. Okay. Um, the anthropologist uh, Grillo once remarked, and this was talking about 1970s France, that the term foreigner uh, had become more used by the political right uh, in order to reinforce the notion of non-belonging uh, to the nation state, while the term immigrant was used for more by the left, positioning immigrants as a labor force. Michel de Certeau explained the distinction um, as being ethno ethnological, cultural versus a historical socioeconomic um, uh, one and having an effect ultimately even on the immigrants themselves, uh, as he said, inhabiting our epistemological territories. I'd like to argue that we need to reevaluate the economics of migration in its largest sense. The migrant is not just a foreigner, but most of the time a worker. Drawing on the last century and a half or two centuries of migration and four decades of research, we need to remember why people move uh, to begin with and who benefits, how people benefit in states as well from migration. So I'll focus mostly on uh, transatlantic and, uh, and intra-European migration since the 19th century, uh, but other migrations in time and space, I think, offer important comparative perspectives um, that may be done in the future. The focus on cultural otherness, which is seen, mind you, essentially from the perspective, as you mentioned, of the countries of immigration, is only part of the story. As the economic demographer Georges Tapinos once wrote, migration is a fundamental economic act. Remembering this could help change the contemporary discourse around migration. I may add a methodological point here about the present. That is, the current events, and notably the so-called migration crisis, I keep saying crisis for whom, it's not just for the immigration state, it's for the immigrants, the migrants themselves. But current events can have an effect um, and can help us ask questions about the long history of migration, whether they be crises or longer term trends. And this can in turn help inform current events. So the present asking questions about the past and the past then helping us um, understand better the present. Today's migrants can thus help historians and can help historians reread our sources and re-question past forms of migration um, and the costs involved. Historically, immigrants have been good for the countries where they have settled. 
the United States, Canada, Australia, all of the old classic countries of immigration, France included, uh, but also the more 20th century uh, countries of immigration, second half of the 20th century, England, Germany, etc., have all benefited from the labor of new arrivals. Over the long term, immigrants have settled in. New, in quotation marks, and suspect newcomers have become old immigrants that are more reassuring. And they're considered to be sort of the no problem old immigrants. Um, and But this is repeated in every generation. So the new immigrants become old immigrants the next generation along. Assimilation, which is a contested uh, concept, is when, however one wants to define it, is largely a matter of time. We can rightly be critical of Henry Ford's English school. Oh, I looked up, every time I look up melting pot um, on the web, the first thing I get are these kinds of melting pots to do fondue. So I just thought I would remind you of the other use of the term melting pot, which for me as a historian of migration could only mean uh, the melting pot of uh, the imagery of the US uh, in the uh, uh, 20th century, early 20th century, Henry Ford had an English school that were on the premises in Dearborn. Uh, and he, uh, you can see the point is that people go in in sort of their native dress and come out looking alike and holding American flags. We can be rightly critical of this vision of assimilation um, as one that sort of happens just by, you know, jumping into the pot and coming out of it. Uh, but integrating a new society is a matter of time. And I do feel that some of the current discourse about people integrating is as though people should do it within a day, a two, a year or two. Uh, but obviously it takes longer and it also takes a certain amount of means to which I will return. Above all, we need to examine more closely the economic import and impact of migration. I propose to do this as a social historian. So I like to be interdisciplinary. At the same time, my definition of social historian is not a quantitative serial historian, but social in the expense, expansive sense, which includes understanding um, uh, economic questions as well. And I think that we don't need to leave the economic questions to economists. I don't want to ruffle any econ economists' feathers. Um, but I think that as a social historian, these are questions that have always uh, interested me. And migration is, as you rightly pointed out, is a very interdisciplinary topic. I think we all recognize that. In the late 1970s, as the new immigration studies took off, one question, which can sort of make us smile today, to me anyway, was whether migration was marginal or structural to capitalism. Was it a temporary phenomenon, as the German term Gastarbeiter sought to characterize it, uh, meant to adjust the equilibrium of the labor market, or something more, or, or was it something more fundamental uh, to the way in which labor, supply, and demand work? As Stephen Castles, who had co-written in 1973 one of the early treatments of immigrant workers uh, with Gojila Kosak, as he recognized a decade later in a subsequent book that he titled here for good. So the immigrants had first been guest workers and then, however, it was recognized that they were settling in. While this sociological discovery of the permanence and the persistence of immigration forgot about the older historical waves of now settled immigrants, uh, Poles, Italians, etc., the point was that migration was now seen as a more permanent factor in the economy and society. Uh, Manuel Castells uh, had already postulated migration as a structural aspect of contemporary capitalism. And 45 years later, migration is not going away anytime soon. Michael Peori, economist at MIT, his, his pioneering book in 1979 entitled Birds of Passage, Migrant Labor and Industrial Societies, theorized the role of immigrants in the economy elaborating on the concept of a dual labor market or a split labor market, which had been he developed with Peter Doringer and Suzanne Berger. Puri showed how the secondary labor market, characterized by dirty, dangerous, demeaning, precarious, and poorly paid jobs, employed youth, women, and immigrants particularly. He did not discuss female immigrants uh, per se. In essence, he was defining uh, females as natives and immigrants as men, 
But immigrants, uh, as he um, uh, analyzed it, did not so much replace native workers to fill jobs, but, but filled jobs that the latter did not um, want. Immigrants are not the cause of unemployment because they are active in another market. The secondary labor market acts as the pull and attracts them because they have little other choice. Peori insisted on the fact that immigrants did not just leave for a better life elsewhere, but that their movement corresponded to labor market needs in the countries of immigration. Much as Isaac Horwich had done earlier in the beginning of the 20th century in a book called Immigration and Labor, and then Harry Jerome had done as well in a study called Migration and Business Cycles, showing both of them. Uh, but Jerome in particular, um, the reverse of the older economists, economists' explanations, and adding an important corrective to theories that up until then had postulated that people left more due to push from their home countries than to pull from the places to, to the places where they were going. Uh, Jer Henry Jerome had showed that they were the economic cycles of the host countries that more correlated to migration than push from the home countries, and this for, to explain the waves of immigration to the United States before the 1920s. After an immigration that was linked to agriculture, and then, of course, the large migrations, proletarian migrations of the 19th century um, were linked to industrialization. Uh, while perhaps he exaggerated a bit, uh, Jerome, uh, his book questioned the romantic notion of, an, uh, of the uh, spontaneous, adventuresome migrant uh, pushed away from home due to poverty or oppression. And Puri continued in this uh, vein, emphasizing the pull. But mm, perhaps you know push and pull have gotten somewhat of a bum rap. Uh, economic balance sheets are notoriously hard to monetarize. How do you calculate things such as ethnic tensions or personal satisfaction? Uh, in his 1974 book, um, Georges Tapinos uh, uh, drew up a table listing the advantages and disadvantages of migration for both emigration and immigration countries. Um, for the sending countries, the advantages include lowering of unemployment at home, technical training abroad with the idea that immigrants will return, uh, remittances aiding the balance of payments. The disadvantages, however, also for the sending countries are that they pay for the education. Uh, emigration can lead to an imbalance in the age structure at home. Um, for the receiving country, uh, advantages Again, each side has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, for the receiving country, advantages include getting workers whose education had already been paid for. Also, the advantage of greater elasticity of the labor market, an increase in national production and exportation, along with the anti-inflationist tendency of immigrant wages, since they are low, um, and, their, and the immigrants adding to retirement um, funds. We know this. But there are disadvantages, too, for the immigration countries, um, for the receiving countries, recruitment and training costs nonetheless, and what Tapinos called specific costs, health and criminality, um, eventually uh, ethnic tensions, not to mention the loss of wages that are then sent back to the home countries. All in all, however, Tapinos ended up his table with just a question mark at the bottom. So there was no, the balance sheet was still indeterminate, indeterminate. Um, and as the demographer and economist Alfred Sauvy said, he, he, was, he criticized altogether the illusion statistique, that it's difficult to make a real, uh, a final statistical analysis. Uh, he talked about the manichaeism comptable, kind of an accounting manichaeism. Criticism of a literal balance sheet of push and pull have fo uh, has focused on the methods of calculation of the variables involved, the difficulty of measuring psychological and quantitative, qualitative factors. But push and pull does not necessarily have to be about an economic balance sheet um, or referring to economic theory alone. There are many reasons that can also be part of why people leave and why people are attracted to another place. Uh, it could be traditional values at home that one wants to escape. It could be violence. It could be an unhappy home life. Uh, it could be a taste for adventure. So many things can push people to leave and many other reasons, a hope of a life without fear of violence um, or persecution or a taste of adventure, again, uh, can pull people to other places. <laughs> 
Migration continues, and a new look at the economics of mobility and of migration in particular needs to reconceptualize and to recognize that migration is an economic act as well as a cultural one. It is not simply a matter of a balance sheet uh, between countries. And furthermore, it is a multi-level phenomenon concerning states and individuals, not to mention the various intermediaries uh, along the route. They all have, among other things, different economic interests. A historiographic comment here. Uh, since the 1980s, since the 1980s, economic considerations and social history itself have taken a back seat to the linguistic turn and cultural studies. But the return of the state, and largely thanks to studies on citizenship, which have really taken off also in this period, um, but both, in a way, have uh, moved the study of migration in different directions. In many ways, migration historiography has followed the more general post-structural move as studies of the structural oppression and grim secondary labor market a la Puri um, have given way to a celebration of migrants' agency, shifting focus from the lacrimose Oscar Handlin uprooted uh, version, vision of uh, describing alienated, displaced immigrants moving across the seas from farm to factory. Um, th the image has shifted to more resilient narratives. Um, John Bodner uh, used the term transplanted to uh, criticize the, uh, the uprooted imagery of, of Handlin. Studies on ethnicity, furthermore, also shifted the um, historiography, emphasizing shifting the emphasis, emphasis from alienation or assimilation uh, to culture as an emotional shield from the rift of displacement. Um, so this too was a needed historiographic um, shift or response to tales of discrimination. Yet one could argue that the uh, structural and post-structural perspectives are still at odds in the migration literature. Uh, while some social historians have indeed brought the state back in, Others have turned to the anthropological subject and emphasized more culture, agency, and resilience. But in a way, it's sort of ironic because one set of studies points to the continued salience of the state, importance of citizenship. Uh, the other makes it more relevant to individual choice, which goes beyond state strictures. In either case, the economic factors aiding, abetting, but also impeding migration, have taken a back seat to the explanatory focus of historians, sociologists, and anthropologists since the 1970s. And even, I would say, the new history of capitalism, which is quite interesting and is bringing important new insights um, to the understanding of slavery, for example, um, has yet to take on free, in quotation marks, or non-forced migration as one of its um, main subjects. So in urging a new look at the economics of uh, migration, I would suggest it needs to be encompassing in asking about economic advantages and disadvantages at both micro and macro levels, inquiring how the economics of migration affects individuals, intermediaries, as well as the states of arrival and those of departure. Let me turn then to migration and work and look at the labor that migrants have um, be been involved in. Work is a fundamental, although not autonomous, factor in the migration process. Um, what I'm just kind of lamenting is that we've lost sight of it. But migrants did not wait until the Industrial Revolution to move. Indeed, the historiography of migration is moving backwards in time to before the Industrial Revolution. Um, moving back to the modern era, the early modern era, to antiquity, even scholars of the Middle Ages have started talking about migration, even in that noted era of stuck-in-the-mud peasantry. There is new look at the kinds of mobility that did exist during the Middle Ages. The barbarian invasions have now being, are now being renamed migration movements. For the early modern period, the picture is even clearer even uh, earlier on, Charles Tilly, Yves Lequin, uh, Leslie Page Mock, for example, all pointed to mobility in the early modern period. Um, mobility over sometimes short distances um, or for short periods of time, seasonal migration that could eventually turn into longer term migration. But if we concentrate on the last two centuries alone, I would make three points. First, that immigrants have participated in every sector of the economy. Second, that participation has been gendered, like the labor market itself. 
And furthermore, immigrants can be seen, in fact, as a bellwether to larger changes in the economy. So some images of where immigrants have worked, heavy industry. The point of this particular, um, uh, I don't know how well you can see it, uh, of this particular painting by Boris Teslitsky um, is interesting because he's not, this is a question for my, m migration museums around the world, thank you. Um, he himself is not an immigrant, his parents were immigrants, but this painting is in the Museum of Immigration in Paris to show labor in a context where we're talking about migration. Immigrants worked in heavy industry. Immigrants also worked in light industry, which I studied myself. Um, garment workers, both in Paris and in New York. What you can see particularly is that they were both men and women, in spite of we sometimes, I mean, some of the imagery of garment work was that it was women sewing always. Uh, but the immigrants were included also men, both in um, Paris as in New York and the different kinds of context. So it's very different than heavy industry. There are reasons that immigrants move to hot heavy industry. There are other m reasons they move into light industry and in different um, uh, locale, different uh, locations, different kinds of, um, of settings, sometimes in apartments, small workshops, et cetera. But immigrants have been everywhere, from fruit pickers to assembly line workers, from street sweepers and taxi drivers to green grocers and nurses. There is not a sector untouched by immigrant labor. Agriculture, heavy industry, light industry, construction, restaurants, small shops, and last but hardly least, domestic work and the care industry today. The immigrant worker is not a uniform concept. He or she changes over time, largely in relation to labor trends in the receiving country. As skill needs have changed, so have the imported skills. While low-skilled, poorly paid jobs um, are still legion for immigrants, changing labor markets have also contributed to the arrival of Nigerian or Indian tech workers, technology workers, uh, while the Philippine government we know today is preparing and, and educating uh, women, they have an entire program, to prepare them to be sent abroad as nurses. There has been debate about the relationship between immigrants and industry. To what extent do immigrants favor mechanization or impede it? Uh, depending on the sector, immigrants have been hired uh, instead of investing in mechanization, but in other instances, immigrants have been hired to work new machines, which natives workers uh, resisted. Immigrants have been the last workers in a declining industry, or they have been part of the expansion of an industry for the garment industry, by the way, they've done both. The xenophobic language that stigmatizes immigrants for offering low-wage competition ignores how immigrants have filled a variety of functions in the economy over the last two centuries. And that labor, as I mentioned, is gendered. So just if we look at any of these sectors, we know heavy industry is more often male, uh, construction industry is male. Light industry has a lot of women in it and some men. Agricultural work, a lot of men, but also women. Shops can be either. The care industry has been largely uh, a feminine industry, thus leading to talk about the feminization of immigration today in relation to the development of the care industry. Yet women have always been an important part of the labor, of the migration flows, whether as part of family units or as uh, single uh, solo migrants. So labor is gendered. We have some statistics and thanks to uh, an enormous amount of work done by Catherine Donato and Donna Gabaccia in their book Gender and International Migration. We can see how labor, uh, how female migrants have uh, come and changed over time. But even if you look at the top line, which is the percentage female within the total uh, arrivals, um, you can see there are some moments when there's a huge amount of the percentage of women, largely because there was also a great drop in the number of men and the number of migration in, um, in general over uh, during the, the Second World War. Uh, but women, although sometimes seen as or thought as historically invisible in migration flows, um, have constituted some, uh, some, since even the first earlier part, since about 1933, since the, the move from that period on shows that there can be 40 or 50 percent women in the migration flows, which is an important number, an important figure, an important, an important uh, percentage. 
Labor is gendered, as I mentioned, although the tasks themselves can change gender, um, such as metallurgy work during wartime, which Laura Lee Downs uh, pointed out in her book on manufacturing inequality. Also for gar in garment work, the tasks that are defined as male or female can also change over time. And immigrant workshops around the world uh, can be largely peopled by uh, women and men at different moments. In the end, I think of immigration as a bellwether for understanding changes in the, uh, in the labor market in general, all in all, or a bellwether of economic change, from backbreaking agricultural work in the 19th century, but also continuing to today, laying the railroad ties in the 19th century, but also then working into the 20th century in mines, forges, and industrial plants. Immigrants have been connected with, and indeed their particular concentration in certain sectors at certain times, are congruent with major economic shifts of the developed countries over the last two centuries. So from agriculture to heavy industry to the service sector today, their concentration, uh, in, in many ways the immigrants represent a concentrate of economic history. Factors, uh, factories yesterday, the care industry today. That being said, the representations of immigrant labor vary considerably, and I think that a great research project now could be done on the ways in which immigrant labor is represented uh, over time. And I have several uh, examples, but that are not, um, it's not, a, it's no, in no way a statistical representation. Uh, it's a kind of a, it's, and it's not randomly chosen either. Uh, but if you look at the way in which, for example, domestic workers have been pictured, I don't know how many of you know Becassine. Becassine is a famous and well-known French, beloved French Britain, uh, French cartoon character. She's pers depicted as a bumbling provincial who comes to the city. So it's, she's a, a provincial immigrant. Uh, but you'll notice she has no mouth. She's never been depicted with a mouth. Um, she, however, is, um, uh, so in a way, to what extent also are immigrants voiceless? Another image of that was, and, but the question is how are the images used? Here, to my surprise, I found these happy laundry girls, a way of using Irish maids as a, an ad for a soap product. Um, in the uh, la 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 latter part of the 19th century. Um, and so once again, how are these images used? To what extent? There's a wonderful contrast, and here you have also the Irish maid who is looking worriedly over um, the man she is apparently working for, but there is a kind of overturned chair in the background, which troubles me, and I need to look more into that particular image. Look at miners, Polish miners. They're hiring photos very stern, very serious. But then look at the use of the Polish miner in the US in 1938, part of the Farm Security Administration, the Office of War Information, um, showing the happy miner coming home from work, one imagines. So what kinds of uses, in fact, also could immigrant workers be in certain kinds of, of imagery? We have for the garment industry, again, which I know quite well, the, the usual image of the sweatshop and, and the, the, the kind of labor that that uh, in, 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 uh, entailed uh, in small, cramped conditions. But also we have sometimes pictures of smiling schleppers, as we call them, in, as they're called in Yiddish, on 7th Avenue. Um, and the other smiling garment workers closer to today 1980s um, uh, garment, Chinese garment workers, but there are other images, and the question is how do people use these images and how are they, um, uh, what do they depict? Immigrants did have voice, have had voice, and have also gone on strike, immigrant workers. Um, various strikes from the very inter multinational strike um, among garment workers at the turn of the 20th century in New York City. Um, where you can see the, the different um, languages in the, um, the uh, banners that are being held. Uh, Chinese, to everyone's amazement, the Chinese women who were working in the garment industry in New York in 1982 uh, went on strike. 20,000 garment women, garment, Chinese garment workers uh, went on strike. Uh, but we have also in Paris, here you have a strike in, for the uh, automobile industry, uh, and you have also uh, metro workers, clean, metro cleaners who um, were on, went on strike in 1980. So we do have both, we have grim 
depictions of immigrant labor, we have smiling depictions of immigrant labor, we can have also striking depictions of immigrant labor. Um, I think all of this merits greater um, analysis. The dual labor market thus was not only a way of accentuating the pull as much as the push, but it was also ultimately marshaled in two ways. So besides the contrasting frowns or smiles, there is indeed a double representation of migrant labor, which is possible. And again, this is partly due to the dual labor market theory itself and how it was interpreted. On the one hand, there was and is a sort of pessimistic structural view of how the secondary labor market um, offers uh, only backbreaking, uh, poorly paid jobs. There is, however, and there became a more upbeat, more post-structural argument or view with greater agency, uh, largely thanks to, for example, sociologists um, Alejandro Portes, uh, theorizing the ethnic enclave. So another way of looking at immigrant labor also has to do with the way in which immigrants band together, the way they give each other information about jobs, and therefore can turn what was a disadvantage of being shunted into a secondary labor market uh, into an advantage of using their own connections in order to have a kind of a protected labor market um, as a result of this uh, secondary um, labor market, thus called the ethnic enclave. Intra-immigrant networks could help lower information costs give direction to emigration uh, destinations, and help finance the trip and aid the finding of jobs upon arrival. Um, anthropologists first used the term chain migration to explain a lot of this community uh, interaction and how the community helps create the migration flows themselves. A sociologist then elaborated on this notion of ethnic enclaves for the newly arrived, and historians engaged in what we called community studies, also showing the strengths of ties and how those ties help immigrants find work even within uh, crummy jobs, but at least it was a way of, of getting jobs. So, but what's interesting is that here we see a, a, another representation of immigrant labor from one that was very um, depressing about the, the, the real uh, difficulties of the types of jobs that immigrants uh, engage in to one that looked at that same, the same people in a way, but in a more positive vein, emphasizing the agency of the ethnic enclave. Um, and that allows economic niches and these enclaves to organize themselves. In this view, the restaurants, shops, workshops all became models for a new image of the immigrant worker and one which uh, brought up also a big discussion about the ethnic entrepreneur. There were debates about how much it was also thanks to these um, entrepreneurs that, um, uh, that who could help organize this ethnic enclave. Uh, the, uh, some of the early studies were on Korean immigrants in Los Angeles or Cubans in Miami. Uh, they served as the first models, but up until today, there is real uh, use uh, still the term is kind of is maybe somewhat less used than it was um, a little while ago but it is and and there have been critiques of a too cheerful model of the ethnic enclave and or of the ethnic entrepreneur uh, himself it was usually a him who was um, who was um, imagined doing this there were also some work on uh, female ethnic entrepreneurs largely in the garment industry, for example, by Miriana Marokvasik in Paris. Yet one could say that whether they are downtrodden or seen as dynamic, the immigrant worker, immigrant workers are an important component of contemporary economic life in general. Um, and I think that that's something important to keep in mind. So let me look at this in terms of different levels. Um, first of all, the individual level. To look at the economics of arrival and settlement, we can look at it with regard to individuals, we can look at it in terms of the states, and we can look in terms the, of, of, of the intermediaries between the two. Migration is not free, and one needs cash or credit to do it. Ever since the 19th century, peasants and other really poor have had to find the means to migrate, and in spite of the image of the poor and huddled masses, which is the image of the immigration to the United States, uh, we know that it is neither the poorest individuals nor those from the poorest areas who actually migrate. 
in the greatest numbers. And economists uh, more recently have also shown that development actually stimulates migration as much as it is supposed to counter uh, immigration. The true lumpen have not the material nor the informational means to migrate. So again, those who migrate are not the poorest. Um, we can think of the economic life of migrants in two ways. So again, looking at the individual level. First, the credit and informational and emotional networks that get them to where they want to go. Then we can look at the jobs that they need to take at the moment of uh, at the time, once on arrival. That is, looking at credit, looking at the route itself and how one finances the trip. Along with the understanding of chain migration and subsequent work on social networks, I'm using the term more a la Latour than a la Zuckerberg, um, but social networks as a form of um, ways in which people mobilize um, in the absence of the internet. Uh, more work nonetheless needs to be done on the contemporary and historical modes of credit. How do people actually pay to, to undertake the journey? Who helps whom and what are the consequences of debt? Several options exist. One can draw upon one's family. One could um, look to immediate or extended family. Um, also mutual aid groups, associations of various sorts. One of the most historically documented and, and frequent modes of mobility of, um, has been having the, the ticket paid by someone else, by a family member who sends money, even if the letter that encloses the money talks about the difficulties of, of life in the new country. The fact that the, someone sends you a ticket kind of count, counters what might actually even be the complaints within the letter itself. So the difficulties of the new world do not mean that people don't nonetheless get um, aid from people who've gone to the new world. But if no one sends you a ticket, self-financing is necessary. This can, can, it can occur by drawing down one's savings, if one has savings. It could mean liquidating land and or land and cows, um, but also borrowing. If the plan is to return and expand one's holdings, liquidation is out of the question as it runs counter to the immigration project itself. So if savings are not enough and liquidation impossible, borrowing is the way to go. From whom? A bank? Unlikely. The family circle is first. Families have long invested in departures in order to hopefully benefit later from remittances, but also perhaps for the term return of the migrant or for aid for the next, for other members of the family to emigrate. The neighborhood professional lenders, or more frequently other forms of um, mutual aid or rotating credit organizations have all been marshaled. But an important question needs to be asked. How does debt have an impact on subsequent employment choices? It's a question that um, could be asked of most US uh, students, actually college students today, because of the debt they're incurring. Newcomers of all sorts have to find and take jobs upon arrival, and those jobs need to correspond to their skills or be sufficiently low skilled so as to have an easy and quick entry uh, for, uh, with easily learnable tasks by the newly arrived. Knowledge circulates about job markets, but the urgency of being um, able both to feed and house oneself uh, quite quickly um, means finding something quickly, whether it is adequate or not. And I think that the debt incurred uh, um, increases actually the likelihood of, try of, of having to find something immediately which uh, needs to be reimbursed in order to reimburse the debt. The cost of migrating thus persists through the migration route itself into job markets and choices during the process of settlement and sometimes for years afterward. Uh, not to mention the after effects on family relationships while debts are being un might remain unpaid. Here too, while much has been said about the intra um, solidarity or the intra uh, group networks and solidarity, more work needs to be done, it seems to me, on the ways in which economic relations may have an unharmonious impact on friends and family. Also for accessing, jo accessing jobs. In the end, however, migrants join the labor force through networks, but also through specific labor market practices. Um, as I mentioned, there are both optimistic and pessimistic assessments of the uh, ethnic economic enclave. 
It helps hiring and may allow immigrants to escape the worst of the dirty, dangerous, and demeaning native secondary labor market. But intra-group hiring does not mean that everything works smoothly either. Exploitation at the hands of a compatriot may not be particularly any better than exploitation at the hands of a non-compatriot. Uh, but little work has explicitly addressed the eventual downsides of networks. We can also ask, how do migration networks provide certain options while limiting others? They allow potential shielding from a xenophobic labor market, but they may create other obligations to parents, to co-ethnics, with moral implications with regard to group solidarity in an otherwise difficult or hostile labor environment, and with moral and financial debts to repay. I just don't, I think we shouldn't take lightly uh, these economic factors that have an impact also on um, intergroup or interfamilial um, relationships. We can return also to the level of the state in order, at the state level in order to ask, because it is the state level where the xenophobic discourse is most troublesome and can have the greatest effect, not only through its discourse, but also through the measures then, policy measures that are implemented. Economists, historians, and the long durée itself um, have all clearly shown that states benefit from newcomers. Predictions, as you know, uh, perhaps at the UN's population division, continue to argue that this is the case today, that immigrants are good for, um, the, for countries. But the state level needs to be broken down into its component parts, that is, both the states of departure and the states of arrival, in order then to reintegrate them both. So again, as I'm arguing that we need to look at different levels of the economics of migration, the individual, the state, and the in-between. We also need to look at the different states and to be able to integrate I, th thinking about both the state of origin and the states of arrival. Disparities between states of origin and states of those of settlement are in themselves historically situated due to colonialism and other uh, geopolitical disparities. Labor markets may benefit at both ends of the route, letting off steam for the countries of origin, participating in agriculture, heavy industry, light industry, et cetera, in the new country. But at least two states are involved, and we need to look at them separately at first, but keeping in mind, again, that it's important that, to understand them together, because migration intertwines the states of origin and the states of arrival, due to the very transnational nature of the migration process. However, emigration and immigration states have historically had very different perspectives on the advantages or disadvantages or on the economic utility of migration. If we look at emigration states, the countries of origin, uh, they have on the one hand sometimes decried the loss of emigrants um, as emptying a mercantilist country of its lifeblood through the loss of military or uh, labor and labor power. But there are also well-known gains for the countries of departure. Um, and emigration, again, can be seen as a safety valve when the population is greater than the resources of the country of origin. Today, they are the remittances that are hailed um, as an enormous boost to the balance of payments of homelands. Although they are also scrutinized and criticized as often being poorly directed, there's a whole literature on this. The immigration states also have their own balance sheets of what are their gains, what are the costs. Um, I think what has happened is we've sort of lost sight of the gains um, and not even looked enough at what the costs are uh, involved for the states of immigration. Um, contrary to what they think, immigration states may well be the greater winners in the transnational movement. Um, but as I see the time passing, I think I'm going to um, uh, shorten this a bit. The added value for employers in the countries of immigration, obviously, as they're looking to lower their labor costs, this is one of the largest movers and shakers of the immigration um, economics. Um, the costs of immigration, um, so there are advantages for states and for employers. The costs of immigration, um, I think, however, have been rarely analyzed in to a great extent. Of course, we see it very much today as Trump trumpets his wall. So we see the costs of, uh, of trying to bar the newcomers, 
um, but something which I think uh, historically could be also m more um, seriously looked at because all of the moments at which there have been attempts to limit immigration have also meant costs building immigration centers, um, creating a whole series of security for this, surveillance, et cetera. There has been work um, uh, about this for the most recent period, but I think more could be done historically as well. So again, at the state level, while much has been written, justifiably so, on the emotional and social costs of migration, more, weak, more work needs to be done reintegrating the economic gains and losses of both countries and individuals into the story. I'll repeat, it's not the economics alone, even though this is the focus of what I'm, I'm looking at today, but it is rather the fact that those factors have been lost as part of the understanding of the discourse and the discourse surrounding migration, um, and this has led, in my opinion, to an imbalanced understanding of the migration process. Let me move then to an, the intermediary level, which is that of the, intermedi the intermediaries themselves, to think about them because the costs of migration, this has been much more talked about most recently because of the trafficking that we're seeing, the examples that are being brought to our attention with the most recent um, movements. The route itself has also now created a, a greater, um, there has been much more, recently there has been some more work on what happens between point A and point B. Uh, this one project, which I was uh, partly involved in, called Les Territoires de l'Attente by um, Laurent Vidal and Alain Musset, looked at the, this in-between period, what happens in the migration process. I had previously talked about les lieux de passage, or the, the places of passage, and how we can look at those moments and what happens during them. They have their own rhythms, they have their own activities. But in any case, they're one, it's not a linear process, and Two, it is a costly process. Um, so here, too, we can look at migration as a business, as a um, uh, commercial uh, enterprise. Uh, early on, um, Robert Harney talked about the commerce of migration, um, particularly pointing to the Italian padroni, who in the United States acted as intermediaries, who were both helping immigrants and at the same time often exploiting them. This double image of the um, intermediaries along the route are important to think about. At the same time, that we can see how there are so many actors involved in supporting what is actually a rather vibrant business, um, whether they be the shipping lines, whether they be transportation companies in general. Uh, there's a real business niche in helping and but often also exploiting um, migrants along the route. The term migration industry um, began to be used already in some of the earlier of, um, of the, since Harney. In fact, the work that Harney did on the commerce of, of migration uh, perhaps also didn't get the attention it deserved, partly because it, when he wrote, which is in the late 70s, we were on the brink of more cultural, ethnic understanding of migration and migration networks. So to point out the potentially exploitative nature within those networks was maybe not um, at the top of everybody's um, agenda at that moment, historiographically. Um, but I think we need to go back to it, look at some of the more recent use of the terms um, migration industry in a series of, of literature, um, and also look at there are a couple of, of recent books that are particularly interesting, one on the shipping companies at the turn of the 20th century, the cartels, how they regulated, how they were interested in migration as a process, how they benefited from it, how they uh, mobilized together in order to organize the shipping lines, how they were in competition, whether or not it was the price of the passage which encouraged migration or not. Keeling doesn't want to make the shipping companies out to be, as some people criticized them at the time, as being the movers of, uh, of the increase, as being the cause of the increase of migration. Um, there are also, of course, many factors involved, but it's very interesting to see how they did maneuver and how they were looking out, obviously, for their own best interests. Very recently, two Danish scholars have looked in a less um, his historical vein, but looking at very interesting things in the contemporary perspective, uh, an important book entitled The Migration Industry and the Commercialization of International Migration. Uh, it's by Thomas Gameltoft Hansen and Nina Nyberg Sorensen. 
and they question the relationship between government, private actors, and civil society today, and how border controls create a legal environment uh, that defines illegality. It, but how they also show very clearly that the legal and the illegal are often blurry, um, that the formal and the informal are often intertwined in the migration business, and how the industry is one of both facilitation and control, which goes back to the notions that Harney had with regard to the Italian padroni in 19th century uh, US. Uh, in passing, uh, in this book, there's a very short few lines. Uh, there is a criticism of the, the idea that we have turned so much to looking at the kind of solidarity within the social networks that we have forgotten the aspects that are what I would call inharmonious. I suggested at one point we need to work more on inharmonious colonies and not just the harmony within the group or the, the, the homogeneity within uh, groups. Uh, furthermore, as um, the two Danish scholars have pointed out, the migration industry is not new. So they mentioned this a bit at the beginning. There's more historical work, I think, that needs to be done. Um, swindlers are as old as Ellis Island. Um, state offices tried to, that tried to regulate trade often attracted swindlers in their wake. And there were various attempts to regulate the industry. So in the 19th century, there were early passenger ship acts that tried to determine or, or to regulate the shipping industry so that they would um, give enough, have enough water, have enough uh, food on board, et cetera. Um, then there were the, and, and one of the focuses of IR in the 19th century were in fact the migration agents. Um, the migration agents who um, were kind of setting up various forms of publicity, propaganda, in order to encourage migration. Um, th but they were, in some of the literature, they were castigated. And even they themselves sometimes recognized that their um, work was uh, not entirely um, uh, on the up and up, if I could say. Uh, sometimes, of course, migration agents were acting as honest brokers, helping people get information, tickets, and lodging along the way. Um, but they were also the subject of concern, if not scorn. Uh, I don't know if you've read Tara Zara's book on the Great Departures. And she makes uh, an entire argument, and, and there's a big chapter on um, a, uh, a trial that, that uh, brought migration agents to the fore and, cr and showed how they had been exploiting uh, migrants along the way. Um, she emphasizes the anti-Semitic nature of the trial. Um, because it was a, it was a, uh, a cohort of Jewish uh, migration agents uh, who were being who were being tried, uh, she also points out that it was part of an argument against emigration that the Austrian uh, Empire di was looked disfavorably upon the mass emigration. But at the same time, if you look at other places. Immigrant migration agents were not Jewish, so the anti-Semitic argument works for the cases that she's looked at, but not necessarily for others. There was a good amount of um, criticism in general about what these intermediaries were doing and the profits that they were making. And uh, in, in uh, an interesting uh, pamphlet written by a French immigration mi migration agent, he himself warned uh, those people that he was trying to encourage to migrate to. He was uh, the representative for Kansas, and then he became also the representative for the state of Oregon in the US. Um, but in on their behalf, he was also um, careful to be critical of his own profession because he said, you know, you should watch out if you go to the US, obviously for Indians and, um, you know, things that could, or, or tornadoes or other bad things one could encounter in the far west. But you also had to be careful to watch out for migration agents saying, of course, that he was honest, but the others maybe were not. So he said, be careful of your own compatriots. They may swindle you. Legitimate and less legitimate um, agents along the way have always been part of the migration story, one that has become um, what is, that is both uh, expensive. Uh, and also, just a reminder, it's never linear. Uh, there's a wonderful installation by Bouchra Khalili, um, some of which is at the Migration uh, History, I think a, a set of which is at the Migration History Museum in Paris, showing people drawing their itineraries and explaining along the way uh, where, why they made different decisions. And also what is striking is how nonlinear the routes are and how people make various zigzags uh, along the way. Um, let me 
perhaps f make a final word on another subject very briefly before then concluding. The last thing one can think about, and, and I mentioned in the, in the abstract, uh, has to do with the um, cost of citizenship. Here are some ads. You can go to th get a citizenship of Moldavia, of Moldova, uh, for, it's the cheapest option. You only need 100,000 euros, and in three months you can get a European passport. Uh, the Caribbean, uh, Malta, there are a series of possibilities I gave you, give you the address right up at the top in case you're interested. Um, but what I think is striking is the way in which even that today, even citizenship is something which that the costs of mobility or of migration uh, are considerable and in some cases very high. We could also talk about the class nature of different forms of mobility. Um, but the uh, ads on this kind of a website are really quite striking. Um, and there is apparently yearly in Geneva a forum on citizenship by investment as a form of. So this is almost the epitome of talking about the costs of, of uh, mobility or migration. I won't go into this further. Let me just conclude with several remarks. The costs of migration are emotional, metaphorical, but also real in terms of dollars or euros or whatever. Uh, this is true for migrants, it's true for the go-betweens, and it's true for states. The economic results may be ambiguous in the short term. Border towns and their hotels uh, may benefit from being filled with immigrants, but they could also then be um, avoided by truckers who used to go there and then see that there are too many migrants and too many controls and so they'll just go elsewhere. For the state, controls cost money. Um, I didn't go into this as much as I could have, but it seems to be a cost that certain presidents um, are, have no trouble spending by declaring that it's a national emergency. You see who I might be talking about. Um, the point is not to come up with a definitive balance sheet. That is not what I'm trying to do here. Uh, but to help us think about the material contours of migration and the ways in which economic factors constrain choices, but also how choices have economic consequences. Um, the choice of uh, the kinds of incurring of debt, just as one example. Yet two centuries of migration have shown that immigrants work hard, increase demand and productivity in the countries of destination, have little effect on the wages or jobs of the primary labor market, send money home to help their families, and sometimes get involved in larger development projects in their homelands. Globally speaking, the costs of migration are high for individuals and for security on, uh, by states, yet the benefits for immigrants and the states are historically founded. So what's the problem? Well, it does seem to me that a lot of it has to do with the discourse or the perceptions that are being used around migration and a misguided focus on otherness alone. How can we change the perspective? So what I'm arguing is that a greater focus on the, economic, uh, the economics may help. Many argue that open borders drive growth. They have in the past and they should in the future. If you believe in supply and demand, I don't know if that's a question of belief or the economists will say that that's just <laughs> another way of talking about it. Uh, for, most of the, for most of the developed countries today, the time is ripe to open the doors. Unemployment is low and so is demographic reproduction. Migrants know it. Why don't the natives know it? Uh, we need to rethink the language of mobility. Heralding mobility is disingenuous when it only concerns the mobility of goods, capital, and businessmen, but not the others. And history shows that migrations are not going to end as long as there is inequality and modes of transportation, however precarious, linking different worlds. Migration should be thought of as a given, and more effort should be made into treating it equitably. Scapegoating immigrants for society's ills does not help either the sending, receiving societies, nor, of course, the individuals themselves. Thank you. <laughs>